Yes. Good evening, everyone. It is my proud privilege to introduce Dr. O.P. Karbanda to you all today. Dr. O.P. Karbanda at present is having is affiliated to Dr. C.G. Pandit National Chair, which is conferred by the Indian Council of Medical Research in New Delhi. Dr. Karbanda completed his bachelor's degree in the year 1976 from the King George Medical College, Lucknow University. His MDS in orthodontics in 1978. He completed his MOR RCS by the Royal College of Surgeons Edinburgh in 2000 and MMA Master of Medical Education from University of Dundee, Scotland in 2006. After completing his master's, he served in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences since October 1985, starting as a lecturer, going on to become assistant professor, associate professor, additional professor, and professor and head of the orthodontics division. And he also was the chief of the Center for Dental Education and Research from 2015 to 2020. Dr. Karvanda has got advanced professional training. In 1990, he has got the certificate in medical education and technology from Dundee Institute of Technology, Scotland, 1995-96, the clinical and research experience in cleft lip and palate, British Commonwealth Medical Fellow, Turner Dental School, Manchester, UK. 1999, visiting scholar, American cleft palate and craniofacial association, USA and Canada. Fellowship, FTS, RCS from the Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh. Fellow of the National Academy of Medical Sciences, India. Fellow Indian Society of Dental Research, International Association of Dental Research, India Division. FICD, and is a fellow of the Indian Board of Orthodontics, fellow of the World Federation of Orthodontics, and fellow of the Pierre de Academy, India Section. He was the director WHO collaborating center on oral health promotion and center of excellence for the implementation of national oral health program. Chief KL WIG Center for Medical Education, Technology and Innovation from January 2014 to Feb 2020. He's got various awards and orations, especially from the Indian Orthodontic Society. He has given various oration lectures for the Indian Orthodontic Society. Indians, and he has been honored for the outstanding contribution as the past president of the Indian Society for Cleft Lip Palate and Craniofacial Anomalies. He has been invited speaker and has also given the oration lectures at World Implant Orthodontic Society, the Indian Dental Association, the Pierre Pochard Academy, the Indian Council of Medical Research, as well as the National Academy of Medical Sciences. Sir, has been involved very actively in IADR. Just sir, just one minute, sir. In IADR as well. And sir has got various uh, publication and research in various journals which are pertaining to orthodontics, cleft lip, cleft palate. And he is on the editorial board of almost all the orthodontic journals which are seen in the world now. It, it would be a very uh, long list if I read his public but he's got major grants, 10 major grants, two international and eight national grants from the National Innovation Foundation. And he's got US granted patents on two things, a method for automatic detection of anatomical landmarks in volumetric data and method and system for automatic volumetric segmentation of human upper respiratory tract. Sir, we are all eagerly waiting to hear on the role of comprehensive orthodontics in cleft patients. I welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I'm much appreciated. Highly obliged for this uh, introduction. Um, and I like to thank Dr. Alvis, Dr. Priya, Dr. Nagu for this opportunity. In fact, I'm very, very excited to share all this with you. So without taking much time, I will be straight away. I think I'll share my screen and is it okay? Should I continue? Am I audible enough? 
Yes, sir. Yes. No, everything okay? Should I continue? Yeah, please continue. Everything yeah. is okay. Yeah. So I have been told to speak on uh, comprehensive orthodontics in cleft lip and palate anomaly, or rather deformity. And uh, I was also listening to previous two lectures. And I thought it is time for me to give some of my views, which uh, uh, would uh, give some an overview, uh, critical information, as well as how the comprehensive orthodontic works. Now, the first and the foremost thing I wish to convey to my audience, which are pediatric dentists, general dentists, and also maybe orthodontists, that when we look at the cleft, we just think that it is a gap. It's not a gap. It is a functional problem where the problem of aesthetics, respiration, speech, mastication, deglutition is affected. And it is not just a small uh, problem. It's a problem which requires a very thorough understanding and I wish to tell you, I have spent 40 years in this, but I think I am still learning every day uh, out of this. And also, I wish to tell you that when you transform somebody's face, you just don't transform his teeth or his face or his lip. You transform his life. And out of this, when you transform somebody's life, by making him feel that he's acceptable in the society, he is just like any other person in this society. Is the most pleasant experience of life for a dentist or an orthodontist. My request, uh, do not take photography because some of the patients are young adults and uh, it is my humble request uh, for that. So when a child like this is born in a family, what happens? the whole family is devastated. And they have huge issues, huge, huge, huge issues. And what are those huge issues? And the first and the foremost issue, which comes the psychological trauma. And if it is a first child in the family, the trauma is huge. And if it is a second child with cleft in the family, trauma is still much bigger because that family has not yet been able to cope up with one child with cleft and they have another child. Then as soon as the child is born, the problem is feeding and chest infection because these children are more prone to get respiratory problems. Then you undergo a primary surgery and there are complications of primary surgery, including complications of anesthesia. As the child becomes about a year, then you realize that he can't listen, he can't speak because he has a problem with hearing and he has a problem with hearing because of the infection traveling from his second tube to the middle ear. And as his teeth come, around three years of age, his occlusion is established, you will find that he has deformed teeth, he has hypoplastic teeth, he is more prone to dental caries. And then after the surgery, the secondary surgery of the palate, there is often a fistula, there is a regurgitation of food, and then as he goes to school, he realizes that I have surgical defects on my lip. I am being teased. And these residual surgical defects become much more prominent as the child grows because after the surgery, the growth of the face is not normal because the maxillary growth gets restricted. There is a malocclusion. There are missing teeth. There are supranumerary teeth. There are hyperplastic incisors. And then as he grows more, he realizes his nose, which looked normal, is now doesn't look normal anymore. It looks abnormal. There's a nasal deformity. And then by the time he's adult, his dentition is mutilated. Then he faces a lot of social problems, psychological problems. And when he wants to marry, he has much more problem. So it's a lifelong problem. A cleft is not a one day issue. It's not two days issue. It is not one year's issue. And this problem goes from generation to generations. So in my lifetime, those children which I have treated, now I'm treating their children. So it goes from generation to generation. And we know the cleft is very simple thing. When there is a difficulty or lack of fusion of the palatal process, the cleft is formed. And interesting thing about cleft is that the fusion occurs 
from front to back, from lip towards the posterior palate. That is the reason that in some patients, particularly females, you have more cleft of the palate and males have more cleft of the lip and the palate. Because in females, the palatal fusion is delayed. That means they have a more chances of insult to this area of embryo than males. And if you don't operate this child, the maxilla grows normal, but that is not what you want because this would be a social issue. This child has never gone to school and when he goes out, he has to cover his face. And then if the surgery is not proper, if it is not timed well, if the approach is not interdisciplinary, you come to an malocclusion, which is so bad, it looks like this. For example, there is a collapsed maxilla, there's a fistula here. This one has severe collapse, V-shaped collapse, severe crowding, deformity of the lip, deformity of the nose. And this girl is again unoperated where the major segment overrides the minor segment. So <clears throat> when you are talking to a cleft child, it means you're not talking to a normal child. You're talking to someone who is handicapped, who is handicapped because of his speech. He is handicapped because of his malocclusion. He is handicapped because of the aesthetics. And consequently, his whole psychology is different. And because his psychology is different, you have to treat him differently. You have to understand him, not that he has a cleft, you have to understand him as a person who has a cleft and how a person of a cleft will react to my suggestions or my advice or, or how I have to handle him for the treatment. Because I am not treating cleft. I am treating a child with cleft. And for that purpose, you have to understand the child first. And of course, you have to know the signs of cleft. Now, this particular girl whom I have treated for many, many years, and then she became a mother and she has now two kids and I'm, she's still in touch with me, contact with me, why? Simply because I was able to make her look like normal with very simple plan of treatment. It was not a complex plan of treatment. It was not expensive plan of treatment. It was not very advanced plan of treatment. It was a simple plan. And yet another girl, whom you can see here, um, she's actually her, if you look at very carefully her two, she has got these two central incisors have been moved to one side. And on the other side, she has a partial denture only, which looks like two incisors. But once you make the treatment decisions simpler, and I will be talking how you can make them simpler, then the cost is reduced, time is reduced. In cleft, more is not more, less is more. And less means at an optimal time. And what is that optimal time? And what is that optimal treatment? That is what we need to understand. We don't need to understand very big science to treat cleft. What you know in dentistry, almost those principles will apply. Some principles of common sense will apply. But I think what is required is your, your overcoming your hesitation to treat cleft patients. Your hesitation to consider them different. They are not different. They are different psychologically, but when it comes to dental treatment, they have teeth. So all teeth require the treat dental treatment. But as a child, he requires a different approach. Now, if I take this that in the world about two to 3% of newborn has anomalies of the craniofacial region, which includes cleft. And what is important for us to understand here is that the poor countries have more clefts except Africa than rich countries. Now, if you look at Australia, it's all green, very, very little cleft. North America, very little cleft. India is somewhat in between. Uh, green and the and the brown. And malnutrition plays a, a very, very important role. And I, I can talk about it very long, but I have to just give you one message that 
please consider any family whom you are in touch whom you are in contact as a dentist you are in touch with thousands of patients but let them know that please take care of your nutrition particularly avoid alcohol avoid smoking and b complex vitamin <clears throat> b complex is important now there are hundreds of classification of clefts but we believe in a classification which should be simple and we created this and this abbreviation that if it's cleft lip we say cl cleft lip and amelot cla if it is cleft lip alveolus and palate clp if it is unilateral uclp bilateral bclp if it is cleft of the palate cpo and is isolated cleft isolated cleft simple life is simple now what is also very important here to understand that when a cleft is born a child may be with syndrome or without syndrome almost 70% of the patients are non syndromic and 30% of are syndromic that means they have associated anomalies which could be a cardiac anomaly anomaly of the uh, urinary tract system spina bifida or of the <clears throat> abdominal system now it is also important for us to understand that if you see a cleft palate alone without lip that means there are a greater possibilities of them being syndromic as compared to cleft lip and palate so when you are seeing a complete cleft the chances of that being syndromic is only 5% but if you see only cleft palate it could be about 50% and now this is the standard protocol standard chart of timing which are very critical that when a child is born um, within few weeks to one year you are looking after his feeding uh, the primary surgery is usually done at rule of 10 that is 3 10 weeks 10 g of hemoglobin 10 pounds of weight palatal repair is done around one year now it used to be done up to 4 years i will talk what is difference and then most of these children will have some issues with the tympanum or middle ear infection you need to give them tympanic tubes and then many of them would require a surgery to correct the velopharyngeal insufficiency and that is done around 4 years to 6 years and then we consider them for secondary bone graft into the defect which is usually done as early as 9 years or can go up to 13 years and the orthodontic continues from 6 years to to 18 years and if they need an orthognathic surgery and rhinoplasty that also happens around 18 years or early so this is the standard you can say schedule or timing of cleft care most of the things will fall in place here but not the initial surgery in indian setup or in maybe in kenya as well i have not seen that country but i would presume so we are almost at the same status now people talk about big cleft teams 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 but there are some key players who are those key players in that team the first and the foremost key player is the cleft surgeon now the question is who is a cleft surgeon the cleft surgeon is the one who is trained to do cleft surgery so what is special about cleft surgery we can talk about it because a cleft surgery requires creation of a functional palate it requires creation of a functional palate functional soft palate it requires a surgery which does not damage the erupting teeth it requires a surgery which does not cause deformity of the maxilla then the other person which is important is a speech person in fact now earlier we used to say the orthodontist is the most important but now we say the speech is most important and the speech is most important because orthodontics can be managed even later in life but speech if not corrected in time cannot be corrected ever it will lead to a permanent damage while orthodontic problems can be handled even later in life you also need a pediatric dentist here which you may not see here a general dentist who will look after the children um, oral health in the beginning so three people are critical orthodontist speech therapist clepsis and now if you have an expectant mother 
and you are expecting on an ultrasound a cleft already because now you can on a 4D ultrasound you can see a cleft. And if in routine ultrasound cleft is found, then probably your the your treatment of cleft starts here because you need to develop a team there itself and you need to make the parents aware about what they are going to face in life and how they are going to face in life. They are mentally prepared for it. They have already contacted the team, cleft team. If they are going for NAM, they already know who is going to do NAM for them. So no time is lost. And as you can see here, I think this movie uh, it may not be working, but I, you can appreciate that you can um, uh, see the even the 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 in ultrasound you can detect cleft and you can also see the movements. Now here, <clears throat> when we talk about uh, um, the aesthetic issues, which are taken care by uh, by uh, ten weeks of time, and then by nine to twelve months, uh, the a soft palate is done. But here, the ENT assessment is becomes important because when we say this is a cleft child, he's not he's delayed in his speech. He may not be delayed in his speech. He can only speak if he can hear. If he doesn't hear, he cannot learn to speak and he may not be able to hear because he has got some issues with his middle ear. So if you are in touch with their family, because when a dentist, don't think yourself that my job is only to look after teeth. That is the first and the foremost thing I convey to every dental surgeon. You are a team of healthcare worker. And as a healthcare professional, you must be aware of that if you know a family who is whom you are treating for teeth, but they also have a child with cleft, then you can guide them. Well, please go and show show to um, the ENT surgeon. If you have not been, please go, please take checkup. So this is the duty which dentist has to do. Now, there are so many things about feeding. Um, I know there is this bottle, meat bottle, but sometimes in, in an area where there's nothing is available, that doesn't mean that you can't feed your cleft child. You could feed your cleft child with simple, simple uh, utensil, which in India we call it pallad. It has got a spout in the in the big in here somewhere here. So if you can make a child at 45 degree, turn him on one side, use this pallad with milk and put it drop by drop, child can swallow. So the secret of feeding a cleft child is that it should not get aspirated. And how you can prevent aspiration is by maneuvering. And, and the other best part about using this steel utensil is that it can be boiled and made sterile. It doesn't cost anything. It, it, it doesn't cost anything at all. It is like any other simple utensil, which has got a spoon-like structure attached to it. Just boil it and it is clean to be used. With regards to pre-surgical uh, NAM, what is called pre-surgical nasal valve molding. I have highest regard for that treatment, but please understand the cost of that treatment. Now, if there is a family who has got a three kids and one of them is born with cleft now and they live 40 kilometer away from the hospital where the service is provided. And if one of them is an earner working, and he cannot take a leave. Now you think of the mother, whether she should look after the two remaining children and the cleft child, and how many times she can bring that cleft child to the hospital, and does she have enough money to bring it every time? So for anything which we do, we have to consider the cost versus benefit. Yes, those who can afford, those who can have it, like when you want to live, you want a clean room. Now this definition of clean room can be different for different people. That if I have a clean floor and clean walls and a good light, I'm happy. But for another person, he wants a carpet. He wants this, he wants a comfort pillow, he wants this. So the yes, okay, that is required, that is helpful, that is better, that is more comfortable. But the person who doesn't have anything for him, a clean room is good enough because to live first you need a clean room. So what I'm trying to say is that 
nasal velar molding is great it is very good but affordability and logistics are the issues if these two issues can be resolved nam is good for example at aims where i worked we could not do too many cases of nam simply because i work in a public funded hospital in this public funded hospital the patients come to any were poorest of the poor and they are, they they won't come to you in time and if even if they have come to you in time they are born suppose a child is born in names and i am ready to give him everything but still sometimes they have issues but for which they cannot come and i also want to tell you that in india about 40000 new cleft children are born every year 40000 new cleft children are born and do we have the resources and logistics to treat all those so whenever there is a requirement for example in this particular child we wanted to centralize the premaxilla the simple age old device works it works so it worked by using a cap we use two hooks which are used for the ladies blouses use a or simple orthodontic elastic make a cap and centralize it now the nasolar molding i mentioned to you before, earlier is showing more benefit for the nose than for the alveolus than for the alveolus so if you want a better nasal correction yes yes but you have to see the most surgeons are happy for example european surgeons norwegian surgeons which are considered the gold standard don't practice nam and many of the clinical trials have not established that big benefit of nam as the effort so everything has to be cost versus benefit and also when it comes to surgery one has to understand the the problem the anatomy the function i'm not going to into the detail but i want why i included this picture is just to let you know that creation of a soft palate which is functional is not just simple suturing the palate it is creating the functional anatomy by dissecting the muscles and making them to behave like normal so if you could create a palate soft palate which is mobile and when on action the pharyngeal walls and the soft palate can come together and make a seal then your problem of velopharyngeal insufficiency is gone the problem of nasality of speech is gone so creation of a functional soft palate is a challenge and and that is where the surgeons expertise surgeons intelligence surgeons ability to dissect the muscles surgeons ability to see each muscle fiber and create a functional palate is critical so most lip surgery is done like i mentioned about 10 weeks and most common technique uses millard because i think millard's technique but i will leave it to the surgeons to do what they do but for a dentist to know uh, how surgery is done he should be familiar with these words so one of the techniques which is used is millard technique now if you look at this flow chart that around 3 years um, now that is the time when a pedodontist or a general dentist becomes very very important because he must monitor the eruption of teeth he must ensure that at this stage the child is not given undue sugars if there is a caries he wants to prevent it whether they want to do a preventive sealing or they want to apply a fluoride or they want to educate the mother and on oral hygiene all these things become very very important because if we can preserve the deciduous dentition we have a better permanent dentition better occlusion so deciduous dentition integrity of the deciduous dentition is the foundation for a good occlusion and this is what we have to understand so so this job can be done by a good dentist or a pediatric dentist it depends who is motivated enough to motivate the parents motivate the child spend time with family and giving them advice and the other most important thing here become the ent surgeon or the audiologist because 
in some countries by law when the child is born the hearing test is done but not in other countries so those audiology test has to be done and a speech program has to continue now is to see a situation like this in cleft child is not not rare it's not that uncommon and then it becomes our duty that how we tackle this problem with regard to speech i told you the first year is very very important and because the speech develops during first to two years of life and for the good speech uh, you know that uh, these four components are important uh, lip seal is very important sometimes lip is scarred there is not lip seal and you can manage the lip seal by simply doing the sulcoplasty if there is a too much of a scar if there is a pellet uh, which uh, which which has a hole obviously uh, it has a fistula then either it has to be covered with a with a device prosthesis or it has to be repaired so when fistula has to be repaired is a, is a million dollar question we can talk about it i already talked to you about well of ringel seal how the short pellet um, resonatory short pellet should be mobile and when you do a child examine a child with cleft one of the things you examine is short pellet movement the clinical examination of the cleft should include examination of the soft pellet in function and of course you need articulatory component the tongue the teeth and the other thing so we know that cleft speech is poorly intelligible sometimes it is hypernasal because there is a nasal escape either from the velopharynx or from the fistula and now if you want to differentiate that why the speech is hypernasal in the clinic itself immediately you have a child who is speaking with high nasal tone and what simply you can do is that you take a small piece of gauze over that put some alginate and cover the fistula let it harden and ask him to speak again you just make it smooth if it was because of the fistula the nasality will disappear or it if it was um, because of the Uh, well of ringel uh, it means it it if it was because of well of ringel in service it will persist so you can you can differentiate that way and here you can see how the when there is a well of ringel insufficiency there is a escape of air and uh, the uh, nasality now for example in this particular child i wish to tell you uh, his name is mohit and he has been again he is also blessed with a cleft child actually and uh, Uh, what you see here is that while we were doing his this treatment his fistula became large it was a small fistula but when his maxilla was expanded the fistula became large and now you cannot just hurry up to close this fistula the first thing you can do is you give him an obturator and a prosthesis and believe me he was treated about 14 years ago or 13 years ago i can't remember the exact year but he has not got his fistula closed and he has been blessed with and then asking why you don't want to get fistula he says i already had so many surgeries in my life i have no guts to undergo a general anesthesia again because this particular simple prosthesis device which was given as a interim device is good enough for me aesthetically as well as for the purpose of his speech i'm not saying this is the ideal treatment but you have to see the logistics and he his he's son of a lift operator actually in a hospital in in gaziabad and he just doesn't want anything more and that's okay now around 6 years 6 years if there is a well of ringel insufficiency and the speech therapist feels that his speech therapy cannot correct the nasality then he has to undergo a plastic surgery operation which is called pharyngoplasty or pharyngeal flare and this is done by the plastic surgeon something more important here i wish to convey you that when the maxilla is not operated that is how the growth of the maxilla occurs prominence of the maxilla but when he gets operated the growth of the maxilla is hindered 
in all the three planes of space. That is the transverse, vertical, and anterior posterior. So a cleft maxilla, when operated, is small in width, in height, and in transverse, and in anterior posterior direction, that is sagittal. Now, and when it is not operated, the maxilla grows, growth is nearly normal. For example, in this case, in this child, this is an unoperated cleft, and you see that how nice his maxillary arch is, maxilla is normal. So the whole effort of good cleft team is to minimize the iatrogenic effects of surgery on the growth of maxilla. And what is the role of orthodontist or pedodontist is to be able to assess the growth disturbance of the maxilla, which has occurred because of surgery and how best to tackle that. That is what is required. So when the surgery is done, there is a collapse of maxilla. For example, in this case, there is a collapse of maxilla of the right side. This collapse is not great. It is quite a reasonable and moderate cleft leading to cross bite of this particular segment of teeth, as you can see here. And in this case, the effect of surgery is much more severe, leading to crowding and collapse of the maxilla bilaterally. And in this case, it is again severe, these two cases where the pre-maxilla has almost collapsed. One thing more important here I wish to tell you is that in cleft maxilla, usually we think that we want to expand the molars. It is not the expansion of molars. It is the unfavorable rotation of molars which has occurred, which need derotation. Now, if these two molars are derotated, derotated, then this will not appear that great a collapse. Collapse will be limited to the anterior region. Now, this is the girl with the cleft of the palate only. And you could see here, she has other carious defects, she has crowding, but her growth of the maxilla, as you can see, is normal. Her profile is normal. She is not class three. Her mandible is not growing more than the maxilla. The other problem which happens in, in the growth of in the cleft patients is that because there is an anterior cross bite, the mandible is free to grow. It keeps growing more and more. So it becomes more severe class three. The other problem why the mandible grows more in cleft patient is that most of the cleft patients have deviated nasal septum. And they also have a enlarged nasal turbinate. So their nose is blocked. They have throat infection. So they are supposed, they are forced to breathe through the nose. And when I have to breathe through the mouth, not sorry, they are forced to breathe through the mouth. And when they are forced to breathe through the mouth, they have no choice but keep their mandible. Uh, this keeps on growing down and vertical. And we know as the dentist that uh, we know that the maxilla arch is has a certain buckle over that, over the lower arch. And that is what defines it normal. And when this relationship is lost, we call it buccal cross bite. So that, that is all our knowledge at undergraduate. So how do we treat buccal cross bite? So we can expand. How to expand? So either we expand only in the teeth, which is called dental arch alignment, or we expand the arch as such, which is called dental expansion, or we expand the entire maxilla along with teeth, that is called skeletal expansion. So when do we expand the maxilla? So if you notice a situation in the deciduous or mixed dentition, we don't expand. Don't just put an expansion appliance when you see a cross bite. You have to see what is the right time and what is the outcome which you want to. So if you see in deciduous and mixed dentition, no. But if you see a situation 
where you have a deciduous occlusion or mixed occlusion, mixed dentition, but a functional shift. So if your cross bite is causing a functional shift of the mandible to either side, then you expand. Because you don't want mandible to deviate and cause, cause facial asymmetry, which becomes very difficult to treat later. So indication of maxillary expansion in deciduous or mixed dentition is, is functional shift. In late mixed dentition, when you do, when you want to do bone graft, that is called pre-bone graft orthodontics. And when you expand in permanent dentition as a part of comprehensive orthodontics because maxilla is narrow, and in adults, you expand the maxilla because you want to prepare the case for orthognathic surgery or for distraction. These are the four indications. So here is a case, <clears throat> excuse me. Where <clears throat> you have deciduous dentition, you see the cross bite, but no, I'm not expanding it. I will wait, I'll wait. By expanding it now, when the permanent teeth will erupt, I would have lost the benefit by then. But here is the case, which is a cross bite. You see, anterior cross bite, buccal cross bite. E. Now, if I have to expand the maxilla here, I have to plan the expansion along with protraction. If I have to plan the protraction, I must be sure that this case will benefit for only with protection that this case will not become a orthognathic surgery case because I want to attempt maxillary protection only in those cases, select cases, where they would be successful. But now this is a million dollar question, which case will be successful, which will be not. So the a general rule is that when the case is in Gosselon 4 or 5, now if I have to explain you what is Gosselon 4 and 5, it is a long lecture, but in short, I can say when the negative overjet, like in this case, is fully established, what you see in this case, that maxilla is narrow and mandibular teeth are retroclined. And why they are retroclined? Because it is a natural compensation by the nature. Nature has retroclined the lower teeth so that your face looks okay. But there is a skeletal prognathism. If you look at this face very clearly, the mandible is long, maxilla is short, mandible is very long. And when you look on the occlusion, it is a Gosselin 3. But if I upright these teeth, it will become Gosselin 4. That means this is not the case for expansion or protection. This case is eventually going to be a case for orthognathic surgery. And for that, I may have to do a bone graft at the appropriate age. And that is the time I will expand it a little bit, the arch, when the all permanent teeth are there, and then we plan it accordingly. So, for example, in, in, in that case, you will see that she also needs a bone graft. And, and if you need a bone graft, you might have to expand at appropriate time. In this case, uh, the maxillary expansion will be undertaken as a part of comprehensive orthodontics. And here is a very good example where you will see that the lateral incisor is a rudimentary and this lateral incisor is missing. So it is a common thing to see in cleft patients, the rudimentary lateral incisors, as well as supernumerary teeth in this area. So this is the only condition where supernumerary teeth and anodontia can coexist, can coexist. And if you want to know why it happens, then maybe you need to read one article in Medical Hypothesis published by me in our 90s, um, uh, the, the hypothesis on program cell death. So that if you want to know more, if you are academically interested in more. Yes. Now in this particular case, we had to align and expand the maxilla because this case is going for orthognathic surgery. So I have given you the indications of how, why you need to expand the maxilla. So what are the devices? 
So devices are, you already know that you could use an orthodontic arch wire if you just want to align the teeth. You could use a parallel expansion screw, which could be the removable type or fixed type. And you could use a framework, which could be trihelix, quad helix, or inverted quad helix. And recently, not recently, since 99, actually, 95, I have been using this night eye shape memory expander, and I'll explain you how it works. So expansion with wires, orthodontic wire is simple, that you have an expanded wire, and this expanded wire you constrict, tied to the bracket, and the, the dental arches would expand. You could use, and this expansion is screw, which has a pitch of one millimeter, and you do quarter turn, which is 0 0.25 millimeter. And the rate of expansion will decide whether it is a slow expansion or rapid expansion. In CLAT patients, usually we like to do it uh, twice in a week. That is one quarter turn twice in a week. That means 0.5 millimeter in a week. That means two millimeter per month. Mm. And usually it is in about four months to six months that your expansion is complete. And once the expansion is complete, you seal this appliance here with cold cure, and this becomes your retainer. The same appliance becomes your retainer. Don't make another appliance to make a retainer. Now, you could use the uh, what is called a Hyrex, which is called hygienic rapid expander. And in CLAT patients, usually you use this kind of device when you want to bond it and not bend it. Personally, I don't use uh, this device in cleft patients because I want a slow expansion because if I do a rapid expansion, there is a situation where I might cause a splitting of the palate and tearing of the, uh, of the uh, palatal mucosa. So I do not want to harm the palatal mucosa. And this is another device uh, when you want to expand uh, more in the anterior region than in the posterior region, then then you use this kind of an expander. So this is again a fan-shaped expander. This is the appliance which is the most commonly used, which is called quad helix appliance. And how it works, the, it is very simple because it has got four helix, one, two, three, four. It has got two arms. These are the two arms. And the quad helix appliance is usually one, two, three, four, four helix. And now, what you can do is that by using the point of activation, you could expand or use this appliance to manipulate the area and segment both. Like you could expand premolars on this side or this side or both. You could do more expansion in the anterior than in the posterior, or you could do use it as a even parallel expander. So like, for example, in this case of of severe crowding of the maxilla. Uh, we use the quad helix appliance. And after having quad helix appliance, we achieve the expansion to this level. This deciduous tooth has been extracted. This later incisor has been extracted. This baby tooth has been extracted. Canine is being aligned. And now this expander, after you expand in cleft patients, you require a rigid retention. That is very, very important. Like in this case, now we have a transpalatal arch, which is soldered to the molar, which is used for stabilizing the aligned maxilla. And this alignment process here, it is going on with fixed appliance. As you can see that this is going to take a very nice shape of the arch. But this does not mean that this shape of the arch is, has a perfect occlusion with the lower arch. So the limits of expansion, you must know that in cleft cases, while in normal cases, we expand maxillary arch when the lingual cusp of the upper molars touch the buccal cusp of the lower molars. But in cleft, we may not be able to achieve this because there is inherent deficiency of the maxilla. So we have to evaluate how much maxillary expansion you can do. So this is a uh, reverse type, a reverse quad helix when you want more expansion in the premolar region, but you rarely use this. Uh, you could use instead a trihelix appliance here. 
Now, you see the uh, expansion is appliance, which is my favorite. And it is my favorite because I use this for many reasons. And one of the beauty of this appliance is that this part of the appliance is titanium. This is a steel. Again, this is a steel. These are the lingual sheets and these are the lingual extensions from this appliance. So what you do is that this part of the nickel titanium wire, you could cool. And when you cool it, because it is a, a night tie uh, wire, which has been conditioned to a temperature that you could manipulate, it becomes very, very flexible. And once it is fitted in the mouth, it from the body temperature, it becomes active and expands. But what I want in cleft patient, I told you before, I not only want expansion, I want, I want the rotation of the molars because molars are usually rotated like this. You want them to go like this. And when the molar rotate, like they are like this. So when they rotate, they carry these arms with them, these two arms like this, and the free maxilla expands. I hope you are able to see it in this, if this works. It did not work actually somehow. There's some problem, sir. Yeah, some of this is not Yeah, it's working now. You can see how the molar rotates. You can see how the molar will rotate in a line. We are trying to open the file actually. Yeah, that's okay. You have it now. Right, sir. 
Yeah. Yeah, so once you insert this NITA expander, it automatically expands and derotates. That is what it does. So you don't have to activate it. So you please select an expander, fix it, and forget it. And then the question comes back to you, we'll see very nice expense. So around next transition, uh, what are the things we are looking at? You are looking at the time when you make a full recourse. Now, we are taking too many reports. Every time patient comes, one x-ray, one photo, one this, one model. Next time, again, one model. He goes to one dentist, he takes one model, he goes to another model. So the full records, full records are taken at six years, when the first full records are taken. And that is the time when you do a complete comprehensive planning. You assess for everything, for everything. And as an orthodontist or as a dentist, you are only looking at a couple of things. First thing, what you are looking at it, is there any crossbite? If there is a simple anterior crossbite, you can correct with a simple appliance because you don't want upper incisor to be in crossbite. You want it to be normal so that mandible does not overgrow. You might consider chin cup or a face mask, depending upon the growth pattern. You might consider extraction of supernumerary teeth. And Little later, you are looking at pre bone graft orthodontics around nine years of age when you want to expand. Now, let us look at some of the cases, case series. For example, in this particular case, we have seen it before that he had a collapse arch. We aligned the arch, we moved these two central incisors into the healthy bone, it crossed the midline, and then we have this area with a large fistula which requires a bone graft and repair, and then he was given a fistula, for example. Now what you see is two incisors have been moved across the midline here. And this is an interim prosthesis is given to him. And on this picture, what you see is that these incisors have received some kind of a composite restoration. And what does it mean that although the investment is very little, the gains are very rewarding. I will share with you on this case of um, cleft palate with pits on the lower lip, a mixed dentition case, as you can see here. He underwent uh, initial treatment with removal appliance. His crossbite was corrected, as you can see here. Subsequently, he, he has a miss he has missing little incisors actually. So with the using the orthodontic um, uh, wires, he aligned his maxillary arch. And after having aligned his maxillary arch, as you can see the amount of expansion that has taken place from here to here to here. And this is the superimposition 3D model uh, where the pre-treatment is um, uh, white and this is green uh, is the post. The arch is aligned. Once the arch, arches are aligned, you provide him an interim prosthesis, and that is how he works in the knees. That is how he looks in the OPG, and we like to give fixed retention uh, in the maxillary, like here. You see the fixed retention in the lower arch. You see how his cranial facial pattern looks normal. And um, that is his opinion. So, simple treatment. During early issues, we only treated his first bite, the dextrous mixed dentition. We waited, in early mixed dentition, we waited. We waited for him to grow. We gave him full fixed appliance, uh, created a space for lateral because of missing laterals, gave him entering prosthesis and debonded. So that was his occlusion. Uh, another case here. And you can see that how, in this case, we have expanded. We have expanded. And once you, one thing which is very important for you to remember that when you expand, you have to disengage 
upper and the lower occlusion. And to disengage the occlusion, we gave him a bite plate in the lower. You could use a bite plate or you could give glass inomer blocks. You could do either of these things because once you do this, the expansion occurs quickly. Otherwise, the cuspal interference will uh, keep the uh, keep the uh, keep the occlusion there and will not allow the expansion to occur. So once it has achieved the expansion, as you can see, it is very simple. Um, you can give him an interim prosthesis, like in this case. And mind it that in most instances, most people have very small fistula, and when you expand this fistula, becomes big and becomes symptomatic. So asymptomatic fistula becoming symptomatic is very common. And at this stage, you should have already warned the patient for bone graft and surgery. Until the time bone graft and surgery is done, you have already given him the obturator with a prosthesis. And uh, you can see the amount of alignment of the arch. You see that this arch is pretty collapsed. This arch is aligned. And this is after expansion. You can see pre post comparison. So you could achieve a significant amount of expansion um, in, in these patients. And here, for example, in this girl who used to come to us from Punjab again, a BCLP case expanded with the help of a NITA expander. The fistula became more apparent. She underwent a fistula closer. And after fistula closer, uh, she looks like that. And then we gave her a prosthesis. The, the hair she is with temporary prosthesis. So when you expand, for example, in this case, uh, what you see that some small fistula can become very big fistula. Now, the cases which I am showing you are those uh, which have been come to us from different parts of the country. They are not even treated in my center. They do not reflect the outcome of surgery in my center. They reflect the status of surgery at a common hospital in India. And those patients who come to us, they are, come to us only those ones who are mutilated, disturbed, could not get treatment in time. And when they come to us, they think that uh, coming to AIMS means uh, some kind of magic there and doctor will do it very quickly. So now there are also situations when you want to do expansion both in transverse and AP direction. So, so far you saw the transverse direction, for example, in this girl, uh, you see that there is a maxillary collapse. Earlier we tried a tried helix to align, but the case was so severe, there was a negative overjet. So she has to be treated with a distraction of the maxilla. So how we distract the maxilla? We use distract the maxilla by using a device which is fixed between anterior and the posterior teeth, this is kind of an expansion screw after expansion. It has expanded that much. And with this expansion, the entire premaxilla comes forward, as you can see from here, that how much distraction has taken place here and here. And after distraction, this is the amount of distraction that has taken place. So now this part will receive the temporary prosthesis and eventually she will get implants here. And, and then we settle the occlusion. We give her a prosthesis here to distract. So the whole maxilla is distracted forward. So it is a expansion in anterior posterior direction, not in transverse direction. So this is the AP expansion at the bone. And you can see the amount of, uh, amount of expansion achieved to correct the anterior cross bite. So, and then uh, the, you can appreciate maybe more here, from here to here to here the amount of distraction and expansion. So now, if, if I summarize uh, in few words that maxillary deficiency is integral to cleft, transverse and AP expansion are possible. They are part of uh, orthognathic surgery as well as orthodontics. Which expansion device to use depends upon the severity of problem and experience of the operator. Timing of maxillary expansion and comprehensive plan are integrated and they are the leading to success. And we as an orthodontist should be aware the limits of expansion or comprehensive treatment outcome because every case of cannot be treated with orthodontics alone. We have to be ensured that this is the case for orthodontics. This is the borderline. 
this is for orthodontics and distraction and that is the case for definite orthognathic surgery so i have lined up a whole lot of series of cases uh, to show you different developing class 3 developing case for distraction and case for orthognathic but um, the time does not permit me to do this but i will share with you one this flow chart that the second set of records first is taken at 6 years second is taken at 12 years and third is taken at 18 years so this this second full set of records is taken just before eruption of second eruption of canine that is when you prepare for bone graft and at this stage it is critical for you to decide that is the critical stage to decide whether it is a non surgical treatment plan means orthodontics alone or it is a case with ortho surgical plan so if it is a case for ortho surgical plan the orthodontic part also differs because orthodontics for surgery is different than orthodontics for orthodontics alone uh, i will like you to share uh, this uh, uh, this site of the india cleft actually uh, india cleft site uh, you must go to this site and see a lot of information what i have discussed with you is available on this cleft site uh, this is the india cleft project which i has initiated we created a lot of protocols about 15 years we have been working on it and uh, you will get lot of information on this uh, about the india cleft quick links and more than anything you will find uh, you can download these two books for the patients which i have written so one this booklet is this is in indian language in hindi and this one is in english video files are available and this booklet is for the the parents of the cleft but i wish to tell you that even every dentist Uh, or every dental student should read it because even uh, this is because cleft is not a part of the curriculum in BDS and this gives the basic information about about the cleft. If you need more, you can write to me. I can also post it. These are available uh, free of cost. So that is the time of third full records. I told you when you want to do surgery around twelve years, and that is how the treatment continues life. So. the comprehensive orthodontics when you are planning for cleft patient should be not that what i can do to the patient we should also know what the patient wants and many a time patient doesn't want orthodontics he wants correction of aesthetics of teeth he wants soft tissue he wants nose he wants lip first so give those consideration to the patient because he is a teen he is going in society orthodontics will take very long time to treat him if some aesthetic benefits can be given to the child especially the teen uh, early by aesthetic recontouring or lip or nose please give this a priority and not then what i can do for him but what the patient also wants sometimes so holistic planning is the keyword which is used uh, in cleft care so i again want to tell you that cleft is just not a gap it is much more than that and i like to thank all my cleft team and patients for this opportunity to work with them and also to uh, to do this and i just want to share with you one picture of this cleft lady um who is herself a dental student actually and now she is this faculty actually in school and what i used to tell you that you can make them as happy as they are sometimes uh, you have to create awareness on the cleft and you can find this on youtube this video on cleft care which uh, i gave in public meetings uh, a lot of this you will find in the third edition of my book uh, which is available both at zvr as well as in amazon and also um, uh, the, this will be available only next year uh, which is in the process I, I like to thank you once again for this opportunity. I can say that I really enjoy treating cleft patients, and, and I wish to tell you, it's such an addiction. If you get bored with cleft care, you will not be able to come out of it. It is absolutely rewarding. Absolutely rewarding. And thank you very much once again. I am happy to take any questions at any time.
questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kabala, for this uh, wonderful presentation and even uh, the teaching on this comprehensive care of uh, cleft palates. In fact, the, the, the pending part normally here is management of the expansion based on the fistulas that you've uh, uh, shown us and even the incorporation of the obturators during that stage is what most people face as a challenge because of that ever-expanding uh, palate during treatment. But thank you for the good lecture, Dr. Kabanda, Dr. Balaji for the moderation, Dr. Priya for the organization with the, the Federation of Special Care Dentistry. We are looking forward for that panel discussion whereby we'll have you, Dr. Gayatri, Dr. Shetty, and, uh, and I think there was one more lecturer. But then we're looking forward for that panel discussion to cover this uh, series of lectures that we've done in this month of November. We'll organize a date with you, Dr. Balaji and Dr. Priya, so that we're able to involve and engage the lecturers and speakers. Thank can you so I, much. Can we take everybody on uh, panel on the on the this on this group so that we sorry? can take? I thought all those on panel can can we have everyone on the uh, there on the video? Is it possible? Because I can see only the, two. I can see only myself, Dr. Balaji. Has to put on the camera on. What about others? If you can put everybody's camera on, you can, I can take a shot picture. And... Yeah. All yeah. right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I think we have to uh, stop the screen share in that case. Maybe. What about your logo of Kenyan, Kenyan, uh, Kenyan Society? The Kenya Association of uh, Pediatric Dentists. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Dr. Kerry is the one who has a logo. Okay, okay. He's not, he's not here. Do you have a system of feedback on the lectures? Do you ask people to fill up the feedback form? They, they, for this particular one, we've not been having them. For this series of lectures, we've not been having them. Yeah. But then we, we also do a recording and allow guys to, to do more. However, you'll definitely be hearing from us, particularly because of the in-depth coverage and all the textbooks that you've shared. Let's, let's actually develop that protocol and have that interaction to, to add more light on our end. Because we have the surgeons in terms of the management, the orthodontists are few who are into cleft lip and palate. So we will definitely need your guidance and the 40 years of experience. Yeah, <laughs> we, we, can, we can never take that for granted. Because no, I'm, not... I'm happy to share everything what I have with me. Because yeah. I actually mm -hmm. many anywhere on this world, on this earth, yeah. I'm happy to do it, yeah. Thank you. So, we appreciate the generosity. You are yeah. truly blessed. We, some of us have just 10 years in, in practice of dentistry, not even specialized dentistry yet. <laughs> uh, Dr. Priya probably has way more. Okay. So there is some appreciation. Thank you for great presentation, especially the orthodontic part. Mm -hmm. All right, I think, uh, yeah. We have a question. Uh -huh. Yes, we have a question. Sir, are you ready to take, sir? Yeah. 
Are there any common complications during this comprehensive cleft lip palate orthodontic management? Yeah, the first complication I told you that fistula becomes asymptomatic, becomes symptomatic fistula. That is one. The second complication is that relapse. Because when you expand a cleft maxilla or when you align, the relapse in cleft patients is much more than the other patients. So you need to have a uh, very, very nice uh, appliance. And like we like to have a rigid wire framework in the palate in addition to uh, FSW, which is called fixed spiral wire retainer. And this retention has to be sometimes lifelong because what said you may do the scarring from cleft right, tends to collapse. So retention is a major, major challenge in cleft patients. And the oral hygiene is another major challenge in cleft patients. So you have to reinforce hygiene a lot, a lot. And if is Dr. Gayatri Monge there? If she's there, and maybe she could throw some light on that part. Gayatri will be there in the next panel uh, discussion. Today she's not she's not part of the of the panel. Yes, well. The implication is that sometimes the uh, actually this um, the wire framework breaks down from the palate, and patients can swallow. So you have to be literally have a close follow up on those patients who are on on expander. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. These are the possible complications. Yes. Okay, I think uh, that 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 marks the last question. Uh, Right, so we look forward to the panel discussion uh, for, for this. Thank you for sharing, uh, Dr. Kabanda. And yes. uh, we'll get some of the books from your from, from Amazon accounts and share more as we go along. Yeah. So thank, thank you, Dr. Priya, for, for being a very good organizer. Dr. Kerry, uh, we, Dr. Dr. Kerry is online. I think maybe you can share the, the logo. You wanted the logo for KAPD? Yes, yes, yes. Dr. Kerry, do you, do you have the logo that you can kindly share? Yes, uh, I do. I will send it to him by, uh, we can by share the, uh, share email. Sorry, what? Sorry? Flyer has the logo. Sorry? Flyer, Sorry, has what? Flyer has the logo. Yeah, yeah, I know. Okay, Excellent. fine, 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 fine. Yes, I will uh, email them. To you, okay. yeah. No problem. I okay. think I wanted to have a screenshot. Of Elvin, something. I wanted to yeah. have a screenshot with logo, but that's okay. He wanted a screenshot, so I think you can put the flyer on or something. You can okay. put the flyer. Let me search for it. I see where it is. Just a second, then. This one? What about that one? Yeah, that is also good. Doctor Elvis, I want to share something very nice about Kenya with you. Okay, go ahead. Two friends, two orthodontic friends who are from Kenya. Uh -huh. And they are uh, on the top of the world and they are both of them are in the US now. Oh, nice. So one person is Sunil Kapila. He is the dean of the dental school in San Francisco. Uh -huh. Second person is Rohit Sachdeva. Uh, they are Indian names, but they are born, brought up maybe three generations back in Kenya or four generations back. Oh, but, right. Both of them are in, in leading in US and they are they are world authorities. So and do, do you do you have their contacts? Maybe we can we can be in yeah, touch. Yeah. Rohit, Rohit and uh, because I wanted to send this picture to them that I lectured for Kenya. That All right. Be your logo. <laughs> there's, there's, like a tiny, there's a tiny yeah. one other there. Very, very happy. We are quite attached. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because their origin yeah. is from Kenya. Yeah. Oh, nice. And uh, do, do you have interaction yes. with uh, Vinanda as well? Uh, Dr. Rohit has a picture in my book. In the history of orthodontics, I put his picture because he's the first person who brought digital orthodontics. Oh, and nice. I have authored a chapter with me. Uh, in, I have authored one in his book on CBCT, and he authored a chapter in my book, which I showed. All right, so, nice. We'll, we'll be reading right. more. And so this is a powerhouse in terms of yeah, technology. I have not been to Kenya, but I will be in Kenya. With this flyer. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so, so much. 
Right. Sorry, I missed that, Dr. Pierre. I said I've taken a screenshot for him. Okay. For, and then um, kindly share the contacts of uh, Dr. Kabanda so that we, we stay in touch. And Absolutely. then, yeah, I, I picked up the email, but I, I guess that, that the, even if you have a phone number or something, I'll, I'll appreciate so that we, we maintain. Uh, I'll, I'll share that with you. And uh, he, we are anyway seeing him next week. As yeah. Manager. All right then. All right, Dr. Kabanda. Once we are, we are set on the date, we we let you know, and then we can have that panel discussion with Dr. Gayatri and Dr. Shetty as well. Thank you, Dr. Priya. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you and everyone. Good night. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.